Welcome everyone. There was once a fellow who went to visit Israel and he gets into the taxi on the way from the airport and the driver says, where to? He says, Jerusalem. Okay, as they pull up to Jerusalem, he says, where exactly? He says, the, the wailing place where people go to wail, to cry. He says, oh, there I could take you there. And they pull up to the Mas Hachnasa, which is the equivalent to the IRS uh, tax collecting agency. He says, here a lot of people cry at this wall. Of course, what he was referring to was the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, where we go to pray. Where Jews, for thousands of years, since the destruction of the Temple, and really even before that, spent time praying there. And the truth is, that whenever we pray, we face east, if Jerusalem is east. And if you're in other parts of the world, you'll face west. But we always face towards that area when we pray. And we pray three times a day. Today I want to talk about why prayer really is three times a day. We have a morning prayer, an afternoon prayer, and an evening prayer. And if that's not enough, that's on weekdays. Shabbos and Rosh Chodesh, the new month, and holidays, we pray four times. We have the Musaf prayer. And on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, we have even a fifth prayer called Ne'ilah. Why are there so many prayers? And if you really look into the biblical sources for this, and the source of prayer is in today's Torah portion, in today's Parsha of Akev, where the Torah tells us, Ula Avda, you should serve him, with your entire heart. And our, this, our sages teach us that with your heart means with prayer. So, how often is this mitzvah of prayer? Now, according to Maimonides, the Rambam, it's once a day. Once a day, a person prays, You fulfilled this commandment of serve Hashem with your, whole, with your whole heart, you're praying, which is great. Nachmanides, however, the Ramban, tells us differently. He says, you don't even have to pray once a day. The mitzvah, the biblical commandment for prayer, he says, is if a person has a problem, there's an issue, there's a challenge, God forbid, turn to prayer. Ask God to help you. Beseech Him for His mercy, for His compassion. But if you have no problems, or if you have no reasons to pray or to ask for help, then there's no reason for it. You don't need to do so. It's fine. Prayer is not required. The mitzvah, the biblical commandment of prayer, is when you're in need. So we have Maimonides tells us, pray once a day. Nachmanides tells us, pray as needed. And some days you may not have to pray at all. And then we have what our sages tell us, pray three times a day. And our question today is, why three? Why daily? How did this develop into that? Why do we have such an emphasis where we stop our work in the middle of the day? We go to great lengths to have a minion, to pray with a quorum of ten people which if you can't pray with a minion, pray yourself. If you can't pray in a synagogue, pray in your house, pray at work, wherever you are. But we have this, this set time, morning, afternoon, and evening. And the morning should be before a certain hour, and the afternoon should be before sunset, and after a certain hour, and evening has to be after it gets dark outside. It's not always so convenient to pray at those times. Why do we have to do this? Secondly, are we not being nudgy? or what's called in Yiddish, I think it's an international word, that we come and ask Hashem multiple times a day when we just asked Him a few hours ago. You just asked Hashem in the morning for something, and you're coming in the afternoon and you're asking again. You just asked in the afternoon, and sometimes just 25 minutes later you're praying again. What's the deal? Imagine you come to your, a child comes to, you, to a parent in the morning and says, could I get that new skateboard? Or today would probably be that new tablet. And you say, uh, no answer. He comes back to you three hours later and he says, what's with the tablet? 
and you don't give it to him. And he comes back five hours later, and again he says, what's with the tablet? At some point, you know, you're being a nudnik. And yet, we do the same thing to Hashem. We pray multiple times a day, and if you look at the text, it's very repetitive. Why do we do that? There's, even if you were asking a minister, a governor, some type of, of official, a king, whatever example you want to give, you ask for something, even if you don't get it, you don't ask for it multiple times the same day. It's, it's just not, it's not manner, it's not nice, it's not effective, frankly. So why do we do that when it comes to prayer to Hashem? And the answer to this important question, which is so central because, as I mentioned, there's such an emphasis on davening, on prayer, is really from a very peculiar story in the prophets in Navi. And this story is so important that it was chosen to be the Haftairah on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. First day of Rosh Hashanah, after we read important sections in the Torah itself, we go and we read a section from the prophets, as we do every Shabbos and every holiday. What story did they choose for the first day of Rosh Hashanah? Get this. It's the story of Eli and Chana. Here's the story. There was a woman. Her name was Chana. And Chana, unfortunately, was not blessed with children. She was married for many years, and she didn't have any children. And it bothered her immensely. All she wanted in life was a child. To make matters worse, she had a tzara, a tzara literally means a pain, but it's a term that Torah uses for those back in the day that had more than one wife. The second wife was called a tzara because it's a pain, it's a suffering, it's an anguish for the, the first wife. Let's just say there's jealousy and so on and so forth. Today it's not allowed, it's prohibited, not just legally, also Jewishly. But back in the day this was common practice. So here you have the situation where she is married for multiple years and doesn't have any children. And it bothered her tremendously, but this second wife was making matters even worse because she would nudge her. Her name was Penina. She would come to her and she would say, you are not worthy of having children. The reason why you don't have a child is not because, you know, whatever, it didn't work out. It's a godly reason. You don't have enough mazel. You're not spiritually worthy of having a child. Because if you did, you would. So as pained as she was, it was even harder. One year on Rosh Hashanah, they went to the Mishkan, which was the temple of that time. It was a, a modern a, a, a mobile temple. They came to the Mishkan. And as they were there, she went away from the group, from her husband, from the other wife, from the children, and she went into the temple, into the Mishkan, and she closed her eyes in prayer. And the way she prayed was not out loud. Her lips were moving, but you couldn't hear any words. And her eyes were closed, and she was praying to Hashem, asking Him for a child. When she finishes this prayer, her, she hears a voice. This voice is the high priest. He's standing right next to her. His name was Eli, and he says, Ad masai How long can you be a drunkard? Stop with this whole wine thing. Stop with the drinking. And she said, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring out my soul to God. All I want is a child. And if you think about this, it's a very strange story. Here's a woman, comes to the temple, she's praying to Hashem. The high priest accuses her of drinking and that whatever she was doing there was just a reaction, a display of her drunkenness. And is, that, is that fair? Is that nice? Why, first of all, why did he even think he was standing in front of somebody who was drunk? Yes, she wasn't speaking out loud and whatever, but still. And number two, why does Torah even record that? Why do the prophets decide to tell us about it? It's a very strange thing. Why would we do that? 
And why would that be the thing on Rosh Hashanah to talk about? There's actually a commentary which says that this was the day that Eli was appointed as judge over the Jewish people. It's a very special day for him. Let's say he made a mistake and he wasn't so sensitive to this woman's needs and he wasn't so empathetic to her problem. But why should we go and, and, and publish it, announce it, and make that the Haftarah of the first day of Rosh Hashanah? The whole thing is strange. But by answering this question, we'll understand what prayer is all about and why we actually pray three times a day. The Rebbe, in a talk that he gave on Rosh Hashanah in 1936, shared the following concept. He says that really, Eli wasn't upset at her for being drunk. He knew she wasn't drunk. His problem was, why are you focused on your physical, material, bodily, so to speak, needs? Why are you focused on physical requests? You have the opportunity to come to the temple on Rosh Hashanah to pray. Talk about spirituality. Ask Hashem to help you. Ask Him to grant you your relationship with God. Ask that God should be the king over the whole world. Civilization should appreciate and recognize God. Why is this you're, you're asking about? You want a child and, you, and why not you? And that's what you're praying for. And that's what he, that's what he meant, drunk. Drunk in his, uh, your actions, your priorities are upside down. You're behaving in ways that are not... Uh, if you're thinking straight and you're on Rosh Hashanah in the temple, your request should be something different. Now, Hannah's answer to Eli is profound. Because what Hannah's telling Eli is, I am pouring my soul out to God. Which means I'm praying now. And I'm telling Hashem what's on my heart. I'm telling Him what's bothering me. I'm telling Him how I feel. And that's what I'm doing. And that's very appropriate. And the end, he actually ended up giving her a blessing and she was granted a son and so on. But she's coming to him and saying, one second, the whole idea of prayer is that I'm coming to Hashem to express my feelings and my needs, not his needs. A person... That's not that you need a bunch of different things and therefore you pray. Because you're praying, you're asking for those things that you need. Okay? What's prayer? Prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a connection. Prayer is not only, I need something, so let me ask. There's a challenge, let me pray to God to save or solve this problem. No. We want to connect to Hashem. And the way that we connect is through getting close and personal. And that's how it's done. Even the word tefillah, it's so often translated as prayer, or in Hebrew, bakosha, request. You're asking for something, which is fine. But it's much deeper than asking. Prayer, really, much more than asking, is connecting. The word in Hebrew, the root word of tefillah, if in the Mishnah, is hatoifel klicheres, a person who brings together earthenware vessels. It's a term that's used for combining, for connecting. And that's what happens during prayer. A person is connecting themselves with Hashem. And you connect yourself to Hashem by talking about your needs, your desires, your requests, whatever's on your heart. That becomes real. Don't look at it and say, oh, it's just me, it's just physical, oh, it's just earthly matters. I should be focused on something greater. Maybe I should. But if right now that's what's bothering me and I'm talking to Hashem, that is what I'm going to be talking to Him about. And not only is it not wrong, but it's the appropriate way to behave. That's exactly what we should be doing. And that's why we pray three times a day. Because the relationship that we had with Hashem in the morning was great. But you got to talk again in the afternoon. It's like couples, right? When they talk to each other at the end of the day, how was your day, or they share things, they're not asking for something per se. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. It's connecting. It's a relationship. And it doesn't get old. 
You asked in the morning, you could talk about it again in the afternoon. You spoke about it in the afternoon, you could do it again in the evening. That is, that is what our idea of prayer to Hashem is. And I want to share a story. It's a fascinating story. That I've actually read this story related by Rabbi Yossi Jacobson. Beautiful story. There was a family who had a grandmother in a nursing home. And one day they get a call to, I mean, the daughters and the granddaughters, the entire family, they get a phone call that she passed away. Unfortunately, it was very tragic and sudden. She was old, but very sad. And they went and they had a funeral, did everything properly, had a large crowd, they eulogized her. And they went home to observe the Shiva, heaven forbid, the way it's done in Jewish tradition. On the fourth day of the Shiva week, they're sitting at home, and the daughters are crying about the loss of their mother, and they're reminiscing various memories from her life, and they get a phone call. The phone call is from the nursing home. Listen, we, we made a mistake, and we forgot, you know, we notified one family, we meant to notify another family, and uh, we, we, we're sorry, but it wasn't your mother that passed away. So what, what do you mean? It was someone else's mother. And your mother is alive. Actually, what happened was, the mother herself called and said, how come no one's coming to visit me? And they came running to the nursing home. And the nursing home said, you know, we made a mistake. We called the wrong family. And the right family, the one who actually passed away, we called them up and we said that your, your mother passed. And they said, well, just do whatever you do with the bodies. She wanted to be cremated, they said. And the, the children went on to say, how you know, she always, you know, she was primitive and she was from the old country and she always said she wants to be buried at a Jewish burial in a cemetery. And we always told her, you know, come on, it's modern day life. We don't do these things. We're not interested. Why waste space? Why waste land? We'll just do cremation. And as much as she begged, we always dissuaded her. And she would always answer us, all I can do is pray. All I can do is ask Hashem to help me. And somehow, miraculously, when she did pass away, the wrong family, I mean, the chances of that, the wrong family found out, and they ended up burying her, not knowing that it's not their mother, proper Jewish kosher burial. It was just a, a fascinating story where you see the idea of, of, um, of prayer and its power. I want to go on and not end on this note of, uh, of a funeral and, and this type of concept. Let's go back to the beginning when we talk about the three prayers that we have, morning, afternoon, and evening. The morning prayer was, was invented by Avram. He wasn't asking for something specific. He was connecting to Hashem. Again, it wasn't about a request. Yitzchak was praying. How, what was he doing? He was turning to Hashem in prayer. Also, not because he needed something. It was the afternoon, he was praying. And Yaakov went to sleep for the night. So he prayed. These three ideas that they were talking to Hashem was a relationship. And therefore, when we have something that we need, we should turn to Hashem. And it's not Nuji. You're talking to the Supreme King. You're relating to Him. You're connecting with Him. And what He wants is that we should ask. And so often, something is not the way it's supposed to be. And the Kabbalists tell us it's because Hashem wants the person to pray. He only withheld it from him. He only made it a little bit more challenging to, to get in the first place because he wanted him to be able to pray. He knew it would cause him to, to reach out. And that connection is what Hashem, so to speak, longs for. That, that concept of prayer is, is what Hashem wants. Let's take it a step further and say that if we pray, if we connect, if we're there... Hashem won't give us as many reasons that we'll have to turn out and ask for things. Everyone should be blessed with the answer to all of their prayers. We should be given everything we need. And as we say in this parsha, 
in the same section that talks about davening, the many great blessings that come from Hashem, which should be seen in a, in a very felt and real way, especially these blessings are very physical and material blessings, may be the greatest blessing in the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. I look forward to your comments, your questions, and please share and subscribe YouTube and Facebook. Have a wonderful day.